Okay, so I'd like to welcome Zee von Seca. Von Seca. I'd like to welcome Zee von Seca. Okay, can I, can I start? Start. Okay, hi everyone. Um, so I'm... Okay, sorry. I was, sorry, I was checking myself on, on YouTube and now I was having a lag. Okay, hi everyone, I'm gonna start now. Um, so I'm gonna be giving you a, an overview of what I've been doing in the past few years or since, since I started postdocs um, after a small period where I did outreach in between my PhD and the first postdoc. Um, so look, it's a bit of an overview but I want to introduce myself first. And uh, so I'm originally from this, uh, this town in the north of Portugal. And we're very proud of our history because um, the legend says that um, Portugal was born here. So here, you see, and we even write it in our old wall that Portugal was born there, just to make the point that I uh, was born there. Um, it's a very nice town. I used to uh, go to the castle here uh, back in the day when I was here, the castle and the ruins. There's the ruins of the of the old um, uh, park where the, the, they live, and and it was open. I used to go there, read, and now you pay five euros to enter. Unfortunately. Um, And so I also like to do scrambling and scrambling is go up rocks, basically. Um, I like some rugby and you can see me here with some of my colleagues in Padua and bleeding a bit. Um, I'm also a very good fan of dialectics and I love cinema. And this is a collection of the films that I've, I've made my life. Um, from Ingmar Megman or Georges Méliès uh, or Emilie Poulain or Fritz Lang, um, Todo Sobre Mi Madre, uh, Weekend Dolls. I really like cinema, I'm a cinephile. And last but not least, this is my dog and she's a big part of my life. Um, and she, she swims, she climbs trees and she brings recently deceased chicken to me. Um, okay, so this is my, 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 um, my path. I studied at Porto, then I did my master's in Cambridge. Well, I did a part three, it was not really a master's. Um, and then I moved to the University of Portsmouth in my PhD. I did some outreach. Then I went to work for the SK in South Africa. Then I moved to Italy and now I'm with you guys. And what I brought to you is, is what I've been working, which is basically synergies between optical and radio surveys uh, to learn more and better about the cosmology we live in. Um, so this is a small um, outline I'm gonna be speaking. I'm gonna try to review a bit what the radio cosmology is, although you have a lot of radio cosmologists in the group and that's why I'm here and uh, I'll briefly go through what is the multi tracer technique, it's something that I work a lot. And, and, um, and then my main interest is to test gravity in the early universe uh, using the multi tracer technique, the large scale structure, and then how we do these things in practice and what else can we do. Okay, so um, radio cosmology is the same thing as optical cosmology for interradio. So we basically are gonna do, we're gonna look for traces of dark matter, like continuum galaxy surveys, or, or H1 galaxy savers, or H1 intensity mapping, uh, with, with uh, basically these telescopes, these dishes, and instead of looking in the optical, they look in the radio, and what they are gonna do is detect the H1 line, the 21 centimeter line, to either detect galaxies or do H1 intensity mapping, or just detect galaxies and look at the continuum and with the positions to cosmology. So the MIR class is, is a survey proposed for the MIRCAT. And the MIRCAT has been is built and is running, is here 
it's well it's in the core of this this is a, a picture of what the sk would be the array and this is an image actually no this is an image of the meerkat um which is will be the core of the sk and h1 intensity mapping some uh, which I, I work with basically what you do is that is you say instead of detecting individual galaxies and with that computer power spectrum and distribution of matter what you do is the following you use the fact that in the radio you barely have any emission lines you have the the hyperfine transition of hydrogen where from the spin aligned of the electron and the proton they go to misalign and they emit a photon with 21 centimeters um, and the reason why you can actually do intensity mapping is that this is the only line around these areas that come the, this, this frequency range that come cosmologically so if you look at your uh, at this figure here and imagine that each dot is a galaxy each dot has gas which is hydrogen that will be emitting h1 and um if you now do a low resolution image of those galaxies and you integrate in every single box the h1 emission what you get is a cmb like map of h1 emission so and and the statistics of the distribution of the temperature follow the same um statistics as a dark matter so the h1 temperature is a tracer of dark matter and also um so there's a lot of reviews uh, of what we can do with uh with because within radio cosmology both with the meerkat and with ska1 and these are the two papers and i i, I invite you to take a look at them although some of the people at the in the group have participated like Alkistes and Phil Bull. So the multi-tracer technique, um, sorry, before that, is if, if someone wants to make a question in the meantime, um, I'm leaving the chat open. Um, so you can actually nag me. And before I, before I go to the multi-tracer technique. Um, Okay, the multi-tracer technique um, comes from one idea, is, is that if you want to measure a parameter that affects your bias, um, so, so let's say it's not a fundamental parameter that comes from the density contrast um, that will affect the growth of structure, but affects how the baryons cluster on on um, on the dark matter halos. If you're looking at, at at the bias or parameters that affect the bias, then um, you can remove cosmic variance by simply taking the ratio of two different traces of dark matter. Um, so so let's go through this image. If you look at the image in red, let's imagine the image in red is your dark matter. So, so if there's bright, there's a lot of dark matter. If it's faint, it, there's little dark matter. And I imagine how you have two different ways of mapping this dark matter. Let's say uh, on the left, you have a galaxy survey that gives you points. On the right, you have, let's imagine density mapping that gives you a map, okay? Both are tracing the dark matter, but they, they look at it differently. Okay, so if you look the the density contrast of this galaxy survey and the density contrast of uh, let's say the intensity mapping, they are bias traces of the dark matter. But if you just want to look at at something that affects the bias, you can cancel cosmic variance if you just take your estimators give or take the ratio of the two uh, of the two. And this is what is in the paper of Seljak in 2009. Uh, you, can, you can generalize it. Um, you can generalize it to, to, you, to a, cover, a more general covariance where you say, oh, I have the autocorrelations of one tracer, the autocorrelations of the other tracer, 
and the cost correlations, uh, include the noise, instrumental effects, foreground. And why is this so important? Um, as I'll show later, the, the bias uh, is affected by local type or molded type non-Gaussianity. Non uh, and one of the main reasons that, that um, you can't measure, uh, or it's not that you can't, but, but uh, one of the reason, main reasons why it's hard to, to measure local type non-Gaussianity on the large scale structure is because it suffers from cosmic variance. Um, so first of all, just to remind you, if you look here, the result of Dalal et al and Matarez and Verde, um, the local type non-Gaussianity creates a scale dependent bias. So it's scale dependent that actually can either shoot up or also suppress depending on the sign of, of primordial non-Gaussianity, the power spectrum on large scales. But because you have a limited universe, so you will only have a limited amount of times you can observe these scales. And that's what means cosmic variance. You have little repetitions of, of those scales in your box. Um, and if you look at the forecasts, for instance, for how well you can measure FNL, and from now on, I'm just gonna say FNL for local type. Um, with SKA intensity mapping, Euclid, both spectroscopic um, and LSST pho photometric, um, you really can't reach a sigma FNL that is around one. Um, and the reason, the reason is because different inflation models uh, will predict different levels, different numbers for, for FNL. But certain types of, of multi-field inflations normally predict um, uh, FNL bigger than one, and single field inflation models predict FNL very close to zero. Uh, and in fact, if you have a multi-field inflation model that predicts a very low, low uh, FNL, still by Oakham Razor, the single field inflation is preferred. So, so arriving to an error that is below one can distinguish between whole families of inflationary models. And actually like, discard some or, or, or provide evidence for them. Um, the other thing is that when you actually look at the position of galaxies, they're not, they're not in the right place, okay? So a galaxy is meets the light. And uh, when it comes to us, we'll go, not only has its own particular velocity, they will perturb the volume. And, and uh, that's what usually is called the redshift space distortions. But that same velocity will change the position of the galaxy. But there's, there's all sorts of like the potential, the gravitational potential in, in front of, you, well, in between you and the galaxy, that will also slightly change the position of the galaxy, magnify it, demagnify it. Uh, but in fact, it will change is the, the statistical distribution of matter or will affect the statistical distribution of matter, uh, how you observe it. And if you think, if, if you now think that you could observe these corrections to the to the angular power spectrum, these relativistic corrections to the angular power spectrum, and you think, could you measure them in single tracer? Um, the, if you think that this FGR parameter is a fiducial value of one, you actually can't measure it at all. And again, is because they mainly affect on large scales. They have a one over k square. Most of them, the Doppler term is one over k. Um, so they mainly affect the large scales. Um, so, although we can't really forecast that we will constrain them very well in single tracer, the idea of, of, of cell jack, of the multi-tracer, actually applies very well here. Because 
if you think that all these effects, in fact, work as biases uh, or affect the but so FNL affects the bias, but the GI effect are technically bias with respect to the to the dark matter density contrast. Um, can we, using the multitracer technique, actually measure um, these effects? And what you see in this plot in in blue is H1 intensity mapping, in red is photometric um, redshift galaxies. And what we did in this paper was just, okay, let's let's do the exercise for H1 intensity mapping, photosynthetic galaxies, and the cross correlation of them. It's not just a cross correlation, it's multi-trace. And if you look, if you look at both the red and the blue line, when you send the noise to zero, you improve zero, you improve nothing because it means your cosmic variance limited because you have no more information to extract. Um, if you use the multi-trace, on the other hand, as you uh, reduce the noise, the noise of your experiments to zero, then you, you can improve your measurements indefinitely. And this is the, the whole point of the multi-tracer. And that's what you see here in the end, is that as your noise is going to zero, your, your error both on FNL and on the GR effects get lower and lower. Um, so just to remind why we should bother this, first of all is to, is to be able to use the large scale structure to distinguish inflationary models. And the error bar of uh, having an error bar below one is very important to measure an FNL above one or below one. Second, also because if you start detecting this, this, this GR effects, which is what we call them, these corrections to the, um, this GR corrections to the angular power spectrum, then you, you, you find a new way, an extra way of testing general relativity and the potentials, especially because the lensing term is, is the most important one. Um, and what else we can find there? Um, and the point that I want to make is that, okay, we, we can use cross correlations to do detections. We can use cross correlations to um, do other type of constraints. But I, my point is that only when you use them all together is that you start beating cosmic variance on, on these parameters. Um, so a lot of people have uh, looked at this, um, especially with the radio. Uh, several years ago, uh, Luis Fermastro um, did it with different galaxy samples, different radio continuum galaxy samples. And he found that um, with several samples, you could start um, getting uh, forecasting error bars, um, forecasting FNL with below one, but you didn't several samples and you needed a detection limit of the radio survey that was very low. Uh, recently, Zara Gomez has, has updated these results. Um, also, also, David Alonso did this with, with internal traces. Um, I call it internal because he used the LSST red and blue sample on top of like cross correlations with, with radio as well. And uh, this is... Uh, the, the work I was referring to, where we looked mainly at Euclid-like and LSST-like, and we were trying to constrain the effect, the GR effect, and FNL together. And so the point that I want to make here is that you can see that if the bias of your galaxy survey is different, you actually get different constraints. And for FNL, you, if you have a more biased sample or highly biased sample, because you're taking the ratio of the biases, that enhances your signal to noise on FNL. Uh, so when you start playing with, with joining different traces of dark matter, then you, you need to, to look at how you optimize the, the two samples or, or how you select two samples that actually optimize your result, if you want to put it the other way around. And this is if you want to have really good constraints. Um, later on, I updated this. Uh, for the red book and I think the main point here that I would like to make is that uh, for instance 
if you do the multi-tracer, you could actually start detect very well the, um, uh, the lensing term. So the lensing correction actually comes out very neatly in, in the, in the multi-tracer technique. So if you think that these fiducial epsilons here have a value of one, and if you believe that the, the forecast is correct and you, is, your error is around 0 0.04, we're speaking about a 4% error in the lensing term, which I find quite nice and quite neat. Uh, so in principle, in the near future, we could, we could start doing these kind of tests. But one can ask, <coughs> sorry, can we do them now? So the Meerkat is actually built now, and can we do them now? And the answer is yes. And, and what I'm showing with these four plots, especially the top ones, is that if you just use the Meerkat bands, you can't do anything. Uh, at all, you actually your error is around on FNL is forecast to be twenty, if so. But once you start multi-tracing it with the DES and the DES and the Meerkat should overlap because they're both in the in in the southern hemisphere should over, overlap somehow. Um, you could start going to errors that are below the blank errors. And in these bottom plots, what you see is that different survey areas and uh, with different integration times and, and uh, what you have in dashed here is, is uh, the Planck error. So in this, in this plot, I actually used the LSST convention for, for the, the FNL, not the, not the um, CMB convention. I think later on I started using all in one convention. Um, but yeah, if you feel if you think that this is a bit different from what you see from the blank papers, it's because I'm using a different convention. Um, so, um, but can we have more combinations of things? Um, one of the ideas I had is that why don't we we use maps of intensity? Because if they, if we do maps of intensity, we actually remove a lot of GR effects or simplify them. And, and can we detect maybe the ISW? Can we detect better FNL? Also because, um, although in this paper I only looked at the lower redshift, below redshift three, um, both Spherix and the SKA will go up to redshift six. And Spherix could do eight alpha intensity mapping up to redshift six. Although I'm not gonna show any results on that. Um, if, you do the, if you play that game, and you multi-trace two maps of intensity, and now you no longer look at the, at the, um, at galaxies. You could you could at some point um, cross the threshold on sigma FNL of one uh, at what is the expected noise, and and rem remember yourself. This only take the volume that it goes from zero to three. Well, not really zero, zero point one to three, and it excludes um, the higher redshift. Uh, so in that case, I would have to do it with, with SK low, but it would be feasible and something that I would like to do in the future, actually. See, when you do H1 intensity mapping with SK low, any cross-correlated spherics, um, you, you can imagine the amount of volume you're, you're including in your, in your data sample. So, uh, but uh, um, because I also am interested in tests of gravity, I then went back and said, oh, what can we do with a multi-tracer to test gravity with your traditional parameters? And one of your traditional parameters is the gamma parameter here, which is um, when you, you parameterize F as omega matter to the gamma. Uh, and the reason is, is that if you actually take thinner and thinner bins on the angular power spectrum, your, your, your redshift space distortion effect becomes bigger and bigger. So for instance, what I show here in this top plot is that with is the difference, is the difference between including and not including redshift space distortions in the linear power spectrum. 
just for to compute the angular power spectrum. So in, in this is the first step is that you do everything in single trace and how well could you you constrain gamma just using the large scales with all these surveys and you see some are worse some are better some are worse but i think the real the real gain is then when you start cross correlating uh surveys that overlap and that's what we did in this in this paper uh, and you can see the gain so for instance in in in, in this case, you see that different surveys actually have different dependencies on um, omega meta and gamma. And when you combine them all, you could start looking at percent levels on gamma, percent level errors on gamma, which is quite nice. So it will be, so it's not a smoking gun, but it would be complementary to the, the small scale, well, smaller scale. Uh, P of K studies of, of F or gamma, test modified gravity. Um, <clears throat> and, okay, this is very nice and cute and beautiful. You probably have now saying, oh, you, you know how to run a Fisher matrix. Yes, I do. And I think uh, there are nice results. I think, I think we can forecast really nice results. And there's really nice prospects. But now I think we also need to think about how we do this in practice. And in practice, in the radio, especially for H1 intensity mapping, you have foregrounds. Foregrounds is a signal that is in between you and the signal you want. It's something else that is, is extra. And um, obviously, I think you probably have heard um, Steve or Paula speaking about this, but I'm gonna tell you what I've done in this paper. So in this paper, what are we looking at is that we're, we're looking at how, how we can start doing multi-tracing practice uh, in the presence of foregrounds and, and, and uh, when we have galaxies. So what we did is we went to, we used the code crime to simulate foregrounds. We use this other code color to simulate um, uh, both the age one signal and, uh, and the galaxies. We, we included, uh, um, SK-like, LSST-like uh, mask, uh, we masked the sky. And then we did the foreground cleaning. Um, and, and then we, we started thinking of how we're going to reconstruct the bias ratios, okay? So if my observable, if my estimator for FNL is going to be the ratio of biases, how well can we, can we uh, measure these ratios. So what you see here is two ways, is using just the autocorrelations to get the, the bias, the ratio of the biases. And the other one is, is to use the cross correlation of H1 and galaxies and the ratio of the H1 and galaxies with, with the autocorrelation of the galaxies. So, both of these estimators should give you the bias of the H1 divided by the bias of the galaxies. And then you can use that as an estimator of FNL. But before we put FNL here, let, we, we look at, let's look at the signal to noise of, of these different estimators. Uh, so in the first, in the top plot here is, is the estimators without foregrounds, okay? Let's imagine that there were no foregrounds and we didn't do any foreground cleaning. What would be the signal to noise for the epsilon A, which is, which is in red, in blue, epsilon X, which is in red. And if you just, when we say cosmic variance plus is, is, is that if you used, so if you estimated the bias using the autocorrelation, and then you estimated the bias using the other autocorrelation, then you took the ratio. That's what we mean by the cosmic variance. Because you estimate the bias in the cosmic variance limit. Um, and you could also include the third way of, of that is that you use all of them, a combination of them, a weighted combination of these estimators. And that's what we call optimal. And obviously we weighted with the, with the covariance. 
In this bottom plot, we don't include the beam. And that's why at the high L, you don't see this drop. This is the drop caused by the beam. Okay, so once we put four grounds, things become trickier, uh, especially because the, the estimate that I use is just the auto power spectrums is actually biased and it doesn't recover very well the ratio of the bias. Um, and it has, <coughs> and it has a lower signal to noise. The main reason for the, these bias is due to the photometric redshift sample. Uh, the photos is, is the photos is that bias the sample. Um, not really the, if you, if you think that you had a spectroscopic survey, you actually, your, your ratio of the autocorrelations would be fine. And you re recover them nicely. And the reason this happens is because if I now do a 1D power spectrum, um, when I, for, when I clean the foregrounds, I actually dump a lot of the, of the power spectrum in the line of sight on the larger scales. Uh, and that's what you see here in the dashed line. So, so the dashed line is, is the power spectrum. Where, so it's, if you clean the foregrounds, all these modes are lost. And, uh, and uh, the, I hope you can see there is a gray area. And this gray area is the modes that you lose because you have a photo Z sample. And so therefore you have large photometric beams. Uh, so you actually lose a lot of information. And, and although you can't do anything about, about uh, well, you could use a spectroscopic sample. Uh, what I thought next is that instead of doing this blind for ground cleaning methods, can we somehow recover these large scales without doing reconstruction or without using a transfer function? So this is something that I, I've, I'm yet to finish and should be appear soon. Um, so let's say that instead of doing the foreground cleaning, we actually model for, we model all how our foregrounds and how they look like, okay? And this is a plot of the cosmological signal, the noise of the, of the SKA, the, well, the noise, like the survey we're thinking for the SKA, and the different components, different foreground components, like synchrotron and point sources, and how they look like, would be looked like by, 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 the, by the survey. And I also include the beam, therefore they're being dumped at, at the higher L. And, and here, what I show to you is like how sensitive is the angular power spectrum at very low L to different values of FNL, okay? And if you think that FNL is probably around zero, um, we're looking at below percent differences. So we need to have very good accuracy at, on the large scales. So this idea of actually, um, modeling the foregrounds and then marginalizing uh, over the foregrounds would jeopardize your, your results. Um, that's true, more or less. And so what I do here in these tables is that this is the, your like standard cosmological parameter set. And uh, imagine that you, your foregrounds are known or they were clean somehow and that would be your forecasts in these percent errors. If I now include foregrounds and imaginalize over foregrounds, actually, the, they don't affect much. They wouldn't affect much the, the, the standard cosmological parameters. But if you look at, at now FNL and GR effects that if the foregrounds are known here in this case, they, they, they have errors of around five. Um, once you marginalize over the foregrounds of the uncertainties on the foregrounds uh, and forget everything else for now, you're looking at uh, errors that not really double, but increase, but not actually, I wouldn't say, I would say that they don't increase catastrophically. So, um, what we're concluding in this work is that it's 
probably possible to uh, forward model the the foregrounds and and also use the data instead of just cleaning use the data to learn something about the foregrounds and in the case of fnl and gr effect marginalize of the foregrounds um, there is a component of this paper which is biasing the results any sort of error in the foregrounds will catastrophically bias your results um, but it, then it becomes evident it's not even like a, a small bias it's, it's an evident bias and and um, which is similar to a recent work of of um, of Steve. Okay, I think I have five minutes. And in these last five minutes, um, let me speak about something new that I've been working on. And this paper is going to come out tomorrow. Uh, it's about looking at the bi spectrum of H1 intensity mapping. And in this paper, we were not very su su successful. But what we were looking, what we were doing is that can all these radio surveys, both in single dish mode or used as interferometers, uh, measure the bispectrum of H1 intensity mapping. And in this table, I show you some results. Um, only SK2 low can provide amazing results, but that's very, very futuristic. The main point is that. Um, and this is an example of band one and band two in the, for the SK1, is that because of foregrounds, we cut a lot the large scales. We lose a lot of information from the large scales. And kind of, this kind of reinforces the idea that we need to find a new way of dealing with foregrounds um, than to just either cut or do blind cleaning. And the blind foreground cleaning is probably fine for, for for the standard cosmological parameters, but for these other things, we, we, need, we need to think of different ways of reconstruct, either reconstructing or marginalizing uh, on the large scales. Um, so I'll finish by, by going through traces of dark matter. Why do I do this is that, so I hope I convinced you that doing the multi-tracer uh, or using the multi-tracer uh, we can, um, uh, we could in principle measure from local type from non and oceanity and, and, and measure the GR effects. So now we should go through all of them. What's the traces of dark matter that are available around uh, for us to use and to see which combinations could provide uh, good synergies between radio and optical. So I'm just, this is just a small list, and there's the PhotoZ galaxy surveys with Euclid, LSST, TES. There's also spectroscopy, spectroscopic galaxy surveys with SKA, with H1 galaxies, um, with DESI, also Euclid, with the H alpha sur survey. Um, but um, so these these surveys, especially W first and, and Euclid, they've been targeting uh, H alpha. And this is something that I've done recently. Um, the O3 line, O3 galaxies are gonna be in the sample as well. And can they be used for cosmology at higher redshift and to cross correlate with, with H1 intensity mapping? And in fact, yes, they can. And this is a work that I've done with Steph. Um, they will cover different ranges of redshift. Uh, there will be enough of them, and that's what I show in these uh, in these figures. Uh, this is like some estimates with simulations and luminosity functions. Um, and if you then run a forecast on it, you could so in this in, in this red is H alpha, blue is O three, and green is O two. So it's a very high redshift sample. You could do BAO at different redshifts, uh, at a higher redshift than than you think and not just with laminal forest. Um, and so, and just to finish, there's also continuum radio surveys, there's H1 intensity mapping, and there's line intensity mapping. Line intensity mapping is you play the exactly the same game with, with, that you did with H1 intensity mapping, but now you use other lines like H alpha, 
C2, CO. People already do this for the epoch of reionization. And there's already experiments thinking on this. And there's already detections. And a couple of years ago, I looked at this. And uh, so basically, we looked at the, how we can predict the signal on these lines. There's a lot of line confusion, but there's a lot of statistical techniques to uh, remove confusion. And so, for instance, the spherics could very well detect the, the BAO using age alpha intensity mapping at Redshift 2. Um, and that's it. Sorry, I didn't. Sorry, there's one thing gravitational waves. I want to also look at gravitational waves to cross correlate. Uh, in the near future, well, in the far future. And if someone is interested, I'm also happy to work on this. Uh, also because I have a good experience with solvers, some cosmological solvers, and I'm happy to change CAMP or others to compute the angle pass spectrum of gravitational wave events or the stochastic gravitational wave background to use them as cosmological traces of dark matter. And um, yeah, this is my summary. And um, I wonder if someone has a question. And this is what I've been doing the past few years. Okay, thank you so much. I'm just asking everyone to unmute if we could all say a round of applause. Am I unmuted? Yes, that's a good start. Okay, so um, give me two seconds. I'm just gonna turn off the live broadcasting actually i can do it from everybody get their hands up ready for questions